open your Bibles <clears throat> to Leviticus chapter 23. Verse 24. This chapter talks about the appointed festivals. We get to verse 24. Verse 24 reads, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, sh shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy Convocation. That's become known as the Feast of the Trumpets, the Rosh Hashanah. Many of you have heard somebody speak on this feast day, and this feast day begun this year, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of the Trumpets, on September 25th, at sundown. And it's not just a one-day event. And as I said before we went to the teaching tonight, we're right in the midst of it. And it ends at sundown, September 27th. So if you really think about it, if the Lord was, was to come back in the Feast of the Trumpets, we still have an opportunity for that to happen. Because it never did say 6 p.m. sundown, Jerusalem time, the Lord would show up at that very second. It doesn't say that anywhere. Does it? I believe He will show up in the Feast of the Trumpets. Now, what hour? Who knows? But if you're holding out for his return this year, there's still an opportunity. So I wouldn't go out and sinning, painting the town red until tomorrow night at 6 p.m., Jerusalem time. Now, I'm kidding. But I'm kidding to make the point. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. Now, this festival, this begins the fall, fall festivals that follow. This festival is known by many names. And the reason why it's known by many names is because it represents many different things. Now, God willing, I'll cover most of the names, if not all the names, attached to this fall festival, the Feast of the Trumpets. It is called the Festival of Trumpets. If you base it on Leviticus 23, now, as I said, it's also called, one of its names is Rosh Hashanah. For those of you who are not familiar with the spelling, first word is R-O-S-H, second word is H-A-S-H-A-N-A-H. Rosh Hashanah. What does Rosh Hashanah mean? What's the meaning behind it? A simple definition is the head of the year. We would describe it in our modern times as a New Year's Day. But a better definition is the head of the year or the beginning of the year. 
let's just call it New Year's Day, Ross Hashanah. Not New Year's Day, January 1st, but New Year's Day on the Hebrew calendar. Now, if you study the history of this particular day, you will find that rabbis taught through its history this is when creation came into existence. This first day, God began creation. This day, on the sixth day, I mean, excuse me, the sixth day, Adam was created, which is Tishri 6. Tishri 1, T-I-S-H-R-E-I, Tishri 1 would be the first day. Adam was created on the Tishri 6, or the sixth day. Another feature about this day is challah, C-H-A-L-L-A-H. Bread was served. Well, it was served really on all the festivals, not just in the Feast of Trumpets. But on the Feast of Trumpets, the challah bread, on Rosh Hashanah, a special round challah bread was made. It was made to symbolize the world, symbolizing its creation. Some place the candle, or a candle, on the challah bread center. And that was to celebrate the birthday of the world on Tishri 1 when the first day of creation came into existence, what God created. On this Rosh Hashanah day, there's really no specific ritual that had to be performed like other festivals, especially in a special or on a special hour. You take Passover, and I'm not going to get into it, but you take Passover. There was a special ritual that had to be done on Nisan 14 at 3 p.m. This day that we're looking at this evening, they didn't have any specific special hour performance that needed to be done. And <clears throat> it's a two-day festival. Most people, when they think Rosh Hashanah is a one-day event. No, it's a two-day festival. That's why I said there's still an opportunity to be raptured this year. Do I think that's going to happen? No. Do I wish for that to happen? Absolutely. But it's a two-day festival. So really, if you really think about it, and go to Matthew 24, quickly. Verse... Hang on. find it here in a second. Verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. We've been there so many times, you should have this memorized by now. I should have this memorized by now. But the day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And there's been many explanations, and I've tried to explain it in a roundabout way over the years when referring to this verse. But if you really think about it, if the Lord is to come back in the Feast of the Trumpets, which I believe He will, and if it's a two-day festival, and there's nothing anywhere that says that He has to show up at the very first second on that 
if he's a trumpet day, then there's the possibility he could show up at any time during those two days. So he really has a 48-hour period. So if you're going to guess what day that he would come and what hour, the day would be easier to figure out, obviously. But the hour, it's a 1 in 48 chance that you would get it right. So when you read this verse, that no man knows the hour of the day, is actually saying, you're not going to know when the events, it predicts, without what act, with, will act, predicts will actually occur if this verse is referring to the Lord's return. It could also refer to the end of the world, the end of this age, or maybe both. The more I study God's Word, I think it refers to both, to tell you the truth. But when you read Matthew 24, 36, have a little bit different perspective on the situation. No man knoweth the hour. So if he's to return on the Feast of the Trumpets on the very first day of that new year, he has a two-day period to show up. Now, wouldn't it be funny if he showed up on the 47th hour, the 59th minute, in 59 seconds. <laughs> and some of you thought it was not that year. Or maybe even this year. Well, enough of that. It was also known as the day of an awaking blast. Write this down. Yom, Y-O-M, Tura, T-U-R-A-H, Yom Tura, another name as I said prior to Yom Tura is the Festival of the Awakening Blast. Just think about it. And this was determined long ago, even before Christ's first coming. The Festival of the Awakening Blast, and some of you already could put two to two together where I'm going with this. And of course, this name is based upon a passage that we find in the book of Numbers. Let's go to it. Numbers 29, verse 1. That reads, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have a holy, you shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. It is day it is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Well, where does it say it's the day of the waking blast there? Underline the day of blowing the trumpets. The Hebrew for the words day of blowing of trumpets is literally Yom Tura. I repeat the spelling. First word Y-O-M. Second word T-U-R-A-H. Yom Tura. And it means the day of the waking blasts. So this verse could also read, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye sh shall do no servile work. It is, a, it is the <clears throat> day of a waking blast. And it starts with the blowing of the shofar. S-H-O-F-A-R. A trumpet looking device that sig signals out a noise to alert people of whatever event. 
Yom Tura is an awaking blast from the shofar. And that would be also used as a signal for the army to wake up and prepare for the day's battles. Think about that. Write that down. Yom Turo's awakening blast from the shofar. It would be a signal and people would recognize it as so if you were part of the army to wake up and prepare for the day's battle. I'm going to tell you right now, when Jesus comes back, that shofar is going to blow. And it's going to awaken many to join into the battle that will take place behind Jesus and the army that's with him. And they knew this long before Jesus ever even stepped into this planet at his first coming. Coincidence? I don't think so. Turah is also translated as shout. Now, the rabbis through the millennium and centuries took this to mean this is the day of the resurrection of the dead. Go to Isaiah chapter 26. Those of you who were around back in the beginning days when this ministry began, I used to say in the Old Testament, my favorite book in the Old Testament was Isaiah. You're going to soon find out why when I start preaching on a certain chapter in Isaiah. Let's just start with verse 2. And then we'll move on to verse 16 through 21. Yes, let's just do that. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keep the truth may enter in. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee, they poured out a prayer, when thy chastening was upon them, like as a woman with child, that draweth near the time for her delivery, is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have as it were brought forth wind, we have not wrought any deliverance in the earth. Neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead man shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Let's read that again. Thy dead man shall live. Now, thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. Now, I read to you Isaiah chapter 26, verse 2, and then we skipped over to verse 16 through 21. You can read the whole chapter if you want. Isaiah mentions here 
The gates are open. What does that mean? It refers to Rosh Hashanah. Did you take note here? The resurrection of the dead occurs at the same time that the righteous nation ent enters in to the bridal chamber? Read the verses again. And is hidden until the indignation is passed. What I believe is what, what what I believe that is saying is we will be raptured. The final fury of God's wrath poured out on this earth. We who put our faith in Christ and be raptured away, up away joining his army will not be part of that wrath will escape that wrath as he pours out his wrath because the iniquity that still exists on this earth the gates are open which will happen on Rosh Hashanah the resurrection of the dead will occur at the same time, the righteous nation enters into the bridal chamber and is hidden until the indignation is over or past. And if you're a Hebrew, you would understand that to be, of course, you would think it's your nation. I think it goes beyond that. I think it's the church including Jews that have put their faith in Christ. If you read in the Talmud concerning Rosh Hashanah, I'll just give you a verse from it. The resurrection of the dead will occur on Yom Hadin. Y-O-M first word, second word, H-A-D-I-N. Yom Hadin. By the way, which is also called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. The resurrection of the dead will occur on Yom Hadin. On Rosh Hashanah. What a day that's going to be, friends. Also in the Talmud, in a different section... What also has been taught is in the month of Tishri the world was created and in Tishri they will be redeemed in the time to come. This is nothing new. This is not centuries old. This is millenniums old. Millennium old. Actually, multiple millennium old. The understanding of what would take place on these Feasts of the Trumpet Days. Rosh Hashanah. Yom Turah. Those are just a few of the names that we've covered so far. Let's get to the opening of the gates. I have enough time to at least cover this part of it tonight. At the end of the Musaf sacrifices, M-U-S-A-F, and what the Musaf sacrifices were was just mostly additional prayers added to the event that was taking place. At the end of those sacrifices, the trumpet would make or blow the loudest blast and the people would shout gates of heaven are open another coincidence of what this feast day is proclaiming which we know what it's proclaiming the gates of heaven are open and they would Blow the loudest and the people would shout. 
the gates of heaven are open. And they would do this at the end of the Musaf sacrifices. Once again, what does this teach us? It teaches about the resurrection. It teaches about the rapture. What all this teaches, teaches us, and this is our hope, that we, the righteous, through Christ, will enter into that wedding chamber and until all of God's wrath is poured out, until all of God's wrath is over, friends, and the Lamb of God is crowned King over all of these, all of this planet Earth and beyond. Now, <clears throat> you read also in Isaiah 6.26 I'm going to read these again some of these Isaiah 26 verse 1 through 3 you can write this down because I'm going to go quickly I think I'm going to also read in Isaiah 26 19 through 21 so read along with me and read it at your own time especially when this becomes available in the read run you could Write all these notes down and then follow it closely. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will, salvation will God appoint for walls and bul bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusted in thee. Thy dead man... Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise, which you already read. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for the dew is as of the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord coming out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, the earth shall also disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. The righteous will perish, the righteous perish. And Isaiah, write this down. Let me go to it. I'm not going to be able to do it off memory, but Isaiah 57. Verses 1 and 2. The righteous perish, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Another passage in Isaiah. Isaiah 13, write this down or go there quickly. It reads, Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. And one more last passage before I have to end this evening. And I'll continue this next time. Is in Revelation chapter 4. Go there. We'll start with the first verse. After this, I looked, and behold, a door. Could that door be the gates that Isaiah was referring to? After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it was a trumpet talking with me, <coughs> which said, Come up hither, and I will show these things which must be hereafter. Hereafter. Now, 
I necessarily don't believe this is tied in exactly with Isaiah. But the reason I'm reading this is to show you that gates and doors are used as symbols of what is to take place in the future concerning certain events. And Isaiah is full of passages that talks about that future event that's coming. The resurrection of the dead and the coming back of Jesus and our meeting of Him in the air. And this will all happen sometime in the future. No man knows the hour. But I think it will be one of the hours in a 48 hour period. Which is a complete Rosh Hashanah time period. It's complete Yom Turah period. It's complete Feast of the Trumpet or Trumpets beginning. Now, that's not all. That's just the beginning. There's more to pull from this festival day, the first fall festival of the new year. But I just wanted to point it out and spend that, the time this year, not a complete study, more of a partial study of how important these festivals are. And maybe throughout the whole year, when these feast days come along, when these festivals took place, I'll take a service program or two and dig a little deeper than I have in these last 16 years. All this, in my opinion, solidifies what God has been saying. And it proves out, because it's all one big coincidence, if they got lucky in putting these scriptures together during different time periods, different millenniums, different centuries, and lucked out a pronouncing of what was to come. That was Jesus, as we'll see in Isaiah 53 and 52, but also other events concerning prophecy and our hope. The Hebrews, the Jews, knew about the resurrection of the dead. They missed their Messiah, but they got the resurrection of the dead right. And they've been celebrating those feast days since they were told to do it in the wilderness long, long ago. Now, there's other interesting things about this day, which I'll get to. But I think I'll leave you with that for this evening. As we look into these meanings behind these names. Day of the Awakening of the Blast, the Day of the Awakening Blast, the Opening of the Gates, the Day of the Beginning, and the Day of the Beginning of the Next Age that's coming, the last millennium, this planet will see before a new heaven and a new earth is usher in. And I probably will, I'll take it out of order dive into what I really think the New Jerusalem will look like. If you're interested in that, let me know while they play a song.